So our last topic for um, derivative rules, so basic derivative rules, before we move on to looking at things we can do with derivatives, is derivatives of inverse functions. So as a reminder, uh, remember that when you define a function, there are a few things that go along with the definition of a function if you're being careful, right? Um, in calculus, we get used to just writing down a formula and saying, okay, there's the function. But remember that part of the function definition is both the domain and the codomain. Those are both parts of the definition of a function, right? So in other courses, you might talk about a function from a set A to a set B, right? You say where the inputs and the outputs live, okay? Now, um, one of the things that you might recall is the following definition, right? A, and I'm going to be a little bit careless with my definition, but uh, a function f is called 1, 2, 1, if. So what do we need to have happen? Well, first of all, what we need is that for every x1 and x2 that belong to the domain of f, okay, what we need to have happen is the following condition. We need it to be true that if f of x1 equals f of x2, then x1 has to equal x2. An equivalent way of phrasing this is to say that if x1 isn't equal to x2, then f of x1 has to be different from f of x2. Okay? Um, now, this is, this is an extra condition that you're imposing on functions. This is not something that's, that's necessarily true of every function, right? Um, what is true of every function is that I cannot take a single element of the domain and send it to more than one place, right? So if this point went here and it went here, I wouldn't have a function, okay? I have to choose one place to send it, okay? But there's, there's nothing stopping me in the definition of a function from sending the next element of the domain to the same place, right? For example, you could have a constant function where every single element of the domain gets mapped to the same number. A one-to-one -one function is going to be one where each element gets sent to somewhere different, right? So to be a function, we can only have one arrow coming out of each element of the domain. To be a one-to-one -one function, you can only have one arrow going in to each element of the codomain, right? So you can't have two arrows both going to the same point. Then you wouldn't have a one-to-one -one function. You'd still have a function, but it wouldn't be one-to-one, -one, okay? Um, there's another condition in a, in a more advanced course or a more theoretical course. We might also talk about functions being what's called onto, right? Uh, and that has to do with the fact that Maybe there's some other point in the codomain that isn't hit by our function, right? So think about, for example, if we just define like x squared, we can think of that as a function from the reals to the reals, but we know that there are no negative numbers in the output, right? It only, it only gives us numbers that are bigger than or equal to zero. So we don't necessarily hit the entire codomain. Um, but we tend to get lazy in calculus and we just you know, sort of identify codomain and range and think of those as the same thing and we don't worry too much about this. Okay, um, so why is it important to have a one-to-one -one function? Well, if f is one-to-one, -one, so if f is indeed one-to-one, -one, oops, one-to-one, one, um, what we're going to do is we're going to define we're going to define a new function, okay? So we're going to define a function g, okay? And and g is going to go from so the domain of g 
is going to be equal to the range of f. So we just define the domain to be equal to the range of the original function. And how do we define this g? So we're going to define it by, well, g of y will equal x if and only if y is equal to f of x. This is one way to define it, right? Um, so the, the roles of x and y get reversed. So g here, g is going the other way, right? So g is going this way, all right? And so the reason we define the domain to be the range is we don't want to have a situation where there's this extra point here that doesn't go anywhere, right? We don't want g to be undefined at some point, right? So that's gone. We get rid of that. Um, the reason why we want our original function to be one to one is that if there were two different y or two different x values that both went to the same y value, and I try to define a function going back the other way, well, now I have two out arrows originating at the same point. That means I don't have a function, right? So one to one guarantees that this inverse, kind of just reversing all the arrows, reversing all the arrows, is essentially what you're doing when you define an inverse. Uh, if the function you start with is one to one then you know that the function you get when you reverse the arrows is, in fact, a function, right? Otherwise, you might have something which is in, in, indeed a function. Um, OK, um, so that's the basic idea. We'll say a little bit more about inverse functions and, and how to work with them. We'll look at a couple of examples before we move on to derivatives. So uh, we, we'll do a little bit more, make sure everyone you know, is, is up to date, because you've probably seen inverse functions before but you've probably also forgotten a lot of what you knew about inverse functions. So we'll, we'll do a few examples to make sure that everyone's up to speed.